Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. I'm Trinway Yap. I'm Research Director for the Heinrich Foundation. Welcome to a joint panel that we've organized today with the US ASEAN Business Council. The foundation has as its mission the advancement of global sustainable trade, and that includes foreign direct investment. We are focusing today on a paper that we co-commissioned with the EU and the government of Japan from the OECD addressing sustainable FDI in ASEAN. And for the OECD, uh, the team that worked on this has been a, a little bit of a labor of love. They worked on it for about two years and for the better part of, of a year, they took uh, pains to build inroads into the ASEAN CCI, which is the Coordinating Co uh, Committee for Investment, where they got rich troves of data from which they formed conclusions that you're about to hear. So we have today uh, with us some of the most important people in the US ASEAN relationship. I'm very honored to be co-moderating this session with uh, Ambassador Michael Michalik, who is former US ambassador to Vietnam and a regional managing director for the US ASEAN Business Council. And joining us by recorded video, I believe, is also Ambassador Ted Ozis, also a former US ambassador to Vietnam and a president and CEO of the council. Um, Catherine Diot, who is CEO of the Heinrich Foundation and my boss, Alexandra de Krombrook, who is head of investment facilitation and promotion at OECD and a principal author of this report, Genevieve Ding, who is head of sustainability policy strategy for APAC in Japan uh, for Amazon Web Services, and Richard Lomas, who is senior vice president of government affairs for the Asia Pacific of Citigroup. Welcome, everyone. Ambassador Mikhailov, over to you. Good. Thank you very much, Chenwei. Uh, and a pleasant afternoon to everyone. We're pleased to welcome you to this webinar presented by the Henrik Foundation in partnership with the U.S. ASEAN Business Council. And without further delay, I'd now like to invite someone who really needs no introduction, our president and CEO, Ambassador Ted Oshis, for his opening remarks. Uh, his remarks today are recorded due to uh, the fact that he's in a, a very early time zone in the United States. Ted, over to you. Good afternoon to everyone in the region and welcome to the webinar, Fostering Investment Climate to Attract Sustainable FDI in ASEAN. I understand some of our participants are already members of the U.S. ASEAN Business Council, but let me thank non-member companies also for participating in this call. To provide a brief overview of what the U.S. ASEAN Business Council does, the Council has been in operation for almost 40 years and represents over 175 U.S. companies in Southeast Asia. Many of them are among the world's largest global firms. The Council serves as the leading voice of the U.S. private sector in promoting mutually beneficial trade and investment relationships between the United States and Southeast Asia. On behalf of our members, I would like to thank and recognize the Heinrich Foundation for partnering with the Council in spearheading the newly launched OECD report, Enabling Sustainable FDI in ASEAN. Southeast Asia has developed rapidly over the past two decades and the region is one of the biggest recipients of foreign direct investment uh, among all regions in the world. The ongoing challenge is to foster an investment climate that will attract sustainable investment that will also further social and environmental objectives. This requires an open and transparent policy framework for investment design and implementation. We hope this webinar will help you understand how relevant stakeholders may support sustainable FDI in ASEAN, including from uh, representatives who are going to talk about ESG and also the digital sector. I'd like to thank our distinguished speakers, Alexandre de Crombrugge from OECD, Richard Lomas from Citi, and Genevieve Ding, Amazon Web Services. And I also want to thank our moderator, Ambassador Mike Mahalik, uh, my good friend and uh, the Regional Managing Director of the U.S. ASEAN Business Council, and also Chun Wei Yap, Program Director of International Trade Research of the Heinrich Foundation. 
I hope this afternoon's session, session is insightful and interesting for you. And now I'd like to invite Catherine Dioth, the Chief Executive Officer of the Heinrich Foundation for her remarks. Ms. Dioth, the screen is yours. Thanks. Thank you, Ambassador Oshis. Thank you for those words. And it's and thank you to the US ASEAN Business Council for partnering with us today to present uh, this webinar. A warm welcome from the Heinrich Foundation to all of the participants today. Uh, at the Heinrich Foundation, we focus on advancing the concept of global trade that's mutually beneficial and sustainable. And we do that through education programs and research programs like this one. Foreign direct investment, today's topic, um, is an important ingredient in the pursuit of greater trade capability. From our perspective as a not-for-profit, FDI and trade creates jobs and, and raises living standards. In China, for example, FDI is responsible even today for 33% of China's GDP and 27% of its employment. It's that important. And we've quantified those numbers for China in previous research projects. So turning to ASEAN, FDI has already been a critical contributor to ASEAN development, and it will continue to be an essential uh, component for ASEAN nations as they uh, advance through the next stages of their development. And yet, OECD data is showing us that FDI has fallen some 43% in developing markets with a very subdued forward outlook. And so we think that we need to pay more attention to the conditions for FDI to flourish. In, in 2021, we were thinking about ways in which FDI could assist developing markets um, uh, to build back better after the pandemic. And, and it so happened that the OECD team was thinking about that too. And so we asked Alex de Krombrug and his team to identify ways in which ASEAN member nations could use foreign investment for achieving sustainable development and sustainable growth. The OECD team went about the task with a very high degree of collaboration with ASEAN member states in order to make their findings, importantly, relevant and practical. And so we'd like to congratulate everyone who participated in the project for achieving just that. Thank you for everyone here today for your interest and contribution to this significant opportunity of our time. Over to you, Chen Wei. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, that, that was a, a really nice sum up of uh, some of the, the key risks of FDI that ASEAN faces, um, as well as uh, you know, a, a summary of the provenance of this report, uh, which you were closely involved in. Uh, we're going to turn now to Paris, where Alex is waiting, and he's going to take us deeper into what is a, a pretty dense report. Alex, over to you. Thank you, Chunwei. Um, good afternoon, everybody, ambassadors, colleagues. It's a great pleasure for me to be here uh, this morning in Paris, but this afternoon in your region. Uh, let me share my screen. I have a presentation for you. Uh, it's a great opportunity for us to present the findings of uh, a report that we recently pub published on enabling sustainable investment in ASEAN. Thank you again uh, to the Henry Foundation for the support and also uh, US ASEAN Business Council for co-hosting this event. Um, let me provide you with a little bit of context before I go into the findings of the report, because I think it's important to better understand where we come from. Um, at the OECD, we've been working with ASEAN, uh, with Southeast Asia for, for, for a long time, particularly on uh, investment policy reforms, investment climate reforms. We've been working with ASEAN at, uh, at country level, but also at regional level. We've provided investment policy reviews, providing recommendations to improve the investment climate overall. And that has been uh, the case that has been the case uh, for, for more than 15 years now. We have a strong cooperation with the ASEAN Secretariat and the ASEAN Coordinating Committee on Investment, as Chun Wei uh, was mentioning before. And then um, came the pandemic. Uh, uh, through, uh, during the pandemic, um, ASEAN came up with the ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework. As you, you all probably are aware, there's a strong focus on sustainable investment. And even some OECD instruments are referred there in this uh, ACRF for policy action. So ASEAN 
came to us to 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 ask for our support in better understanding the concept of sustainable investment how to apply it uh, to their uh, investment policy frameworks so we've been working so thanks to the henry foundation and and on, and other partners we've been working on this report collecting new data uh with with asean countries uh, serves through surveys um fact finding fact checking and we've been doing an analysis and, and some of the findings I will uh, just present to you uh, right now. We've presented the results at the OECD Investment Committee and at the ASEAN Coordinating Committee on Investment in, in a very participatory uh, process, and it was published in January uh, 2023. So the report uh, is divided in three main chapters. The first chapter is really looking at the, the, the the investment policy framework to promote sustainable investment. So that's the reforms, the strategies that are needed uh, to promote sustainable investment. The second focuses on responsible business conduct. So what can government do to help companies promote responsible business conduct? And the third is a focus chapter on uh, investment for green growth in particular. We're using a number of OEC tools and indicators that we have uh, uh, available in the OECD, which help uh, make investment work for sustainable investment in, in general that we have applied to the to the region. So let's let me now move to the the first chapter and the the, the broader investment policy framework for for attracting sustainable investment. So. We first, I mean, it's true what has been said that um, ASEAN has been a very successful uh, region in terms of attracting FDI. Um, however, uh, so the, the, one of the key conditions to do that is to be open to FDI. It's also a key condition to attract sustainable investment in particular. We have a tool at the OECD, which is called the uh, FDI Regulatory Restrictiveness Index, which you can see here. Uh, which is looking at the statut statutory restrictions to foreign direct investment. And you can see the, the dark blue bars are ASEAN countries, some of which are still quite restrictive. So in our finding, we see that ASEAN countries over time have liberalized FDI restrictions quite significantly, but there are many barriers that remain in some countries, in some countries more than others, and in some sectors, uh, particularly uh, services sectors in particular. So these restrictions take the form of equity restrictions uh, most of the time. So this is, as I said, a precondition to attract more sustainable investment because as you can see here, um, FDI restrictions as captured by the OECD FDI index are strongly correlated with the stock of FDI in, the, in, in individual ASEAN member states relative to the size of the market as you can see on the right graph. But openness to FDI is not just about higher investment stocks. It is also associated with um, broader benefits in terms of, it, in terms of the SDGs, such as higher productivity, skills development, and gender balance, for example. FDI restrictions can impede productivity growth and competitiveness, not only in the restricted sector, themselves, but also in downstream sectors, like you can see on the right figure, which is focusing on the services restrictions. As I said before, this is the this is the se sector where restrictions are the highest in ASEAN countries. Um, so this is about the policies in place, the broader framework. Now, ASEAN countries are also focusing increasingly on sustainable investment in their investment promotion strategies. And that's also a prerequisite. One thing is to be open to investment. The other thing is then to, to target the, the kind of investment that you want to attract to promote sustainable investment. So we have been conducting a survey of ASEAN investment promotion agencies to better understand the investment promotion strategies and the role of the, of the SDGs in these strategies. Um, we So investment promotion strategies in general uh, in all countries in the world, they are motivated by, by a series of factors that allow countries to focus their efforts on certain markets, on certain sectors, industries, firms, projects, etc. And it's in, we wanted to understand the role of the SDGs in these strategies. And we see actually that um, 
the SDGs are quite high on the agenda uh, of ASEAN countries. Uh, it, it's among the top factors motivating their investment promotion strategies. 56% of ASEAN countries would um, consider them uh, as a top factor, uh, which is higher, as you can see, than OECD countries, which is interesting um, for, for, for various reasons. Uh, um, so OECD countries are more pragmatic and look at the results of previous monitoring and evaluation, um, for example, among others. So that's what is motivating investment promotion uh, strategies. Um, to have good investment promotion strategies in place, uh, you need to use the right indicators to target priority FDI. Those FDI you want to attract in, in, in priority. Of course, you're open to all FDI, or you should be, but then you can also target some. And investment promotion agencies, when they do that, they rely on indicators related to outcomes to select these priority firms. And many of this, so all these outcomes or many of these outcomes that have we have categorized here are related to the SDGs. And it's not surprising that the most used indicators are those relating to productivity and innovation and those on job quantity and quality. They're also quite high on exports and digital. And then half of ASEAN member states use low carbon transition indicators to attract priority investors, which is interesting. It's easy to look at, at it either through um, half full glass perspective or half empty. But I think 50% is already quite encouraging. It's also even slightly more than OECD countries. So I think it's good. It's going in the right, di right direction. Uh, also, like more than a third of ASEAN member states, which are also taking into account gender equality when they prioritize investors in their investment promotion uh, strategy. What we also found, which is not included in this slide, but we, what we also found is that it's one thing to use the right indicators to target priority FDI, but then it's also important to use appropriate indicators to measure the sustainability impact of the attracted investment. And that's something on which ASEAN countries are much weaker. There are only two or three countries which have such indicators in place. So there is a need to reinforce these indicators to support the ambitious sustainable investment promotion priorities that the, 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 the governments have set out that we have seen in the previous slides. Um, so this is for the first chapter on the investment policy and promotion aspects of, uh, of sustainable investment, of attracting sustainable investment. So let me now move on to um, the responsible business conduct uh, uh, aspect of sustainable investment, which is, um, uh, as you know, responsible business conduct is about promoting the sustainable impacts of, of businesses, minimizing its potential uh, harmful effects. It's uh, actions that are taken by, by businesses, but of course governments can do a lot to, uh, to support responsible business conduct actions by companies. And that's what uh, I can tell you here because I speak from a government perspective. I mean, uh, we provide recommendations to government. So, so here is really what governments can do to promote responsible responsible conduct, promote and enable it. So there are a number of actions, initiatives in ASEAN at regional and country level. You can see many of them here. Uh, I will not go through all of them individually, but um, we mentioned the, the ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework before. It's a, it's a recent example of regional initiative, um, which is putting particularly strong emphasis on RBC and on sustainable investment. And then at the country level, uh, one of the most notable um, initiatives are the national ac action plans for business and human rights. Thailand was uh, the first ASEAN member state to adopt such an action plan in 2019, focusing on labor, land, environment, human rights, and foreign investment. And then Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, and Vietnam are now in the process of developing such action plans or have committed to develop one. And then there are a number of other thematic and sectoral guidelines, initiatives taken by the businesses, as well as platforms for peer learning and exchanges. 
So those are very valuable initiatives to enable RBC in ASEAN. Of course, there are challenges that remain. Um, the policy frameworks in place to promote RBC they very wi widely, very very widely from across the AMS or so from from a country to another, they can be very different. Uh, so some 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 countries really need to catch up with others, but then all countries experience difficulties in the implementation and enforcement of national frameworks on RBC. And there are some aspects which lag a little bit more behind related to climate change, anti-corruption, et cetera. So we recommend uh, countries uh, in order to enable RBC in ASEAN to improve efforts to create an enabling environment for RBC across uh, ASEAN member states particularly by progressing on the national action plans and strengthening investment in RBC-related institutions, but also inform domestic policies by regional efforts and peer learning at ASEAN level. Um, strengthen also the efforts to promote RBC due diligence. More can be done to encourage practices to improve RBC risk management across company operations supply chains and business relationships, and also ensure more systematic, meaningful stakeholder engagement with trade unions, with civil society, and of course, with the business community to build a sustainable and responsible business environment. So those are our findings from our re recent research on, on RBC in ASEAN. And I will now move to the, the third chapter on green growth looking at uh, FDI and green growth in ASEAN in particular. So as, um, as, as we mentioned already, FDI into ASEAN has done um, a lot of good things. Uh, it has increased a lot over the last two decades. It has been a key driver of development, uh, job creation, raising living standards, but it has not always been aligned with green growth and climate objectives. You can see, for example, in the top left quadrant uh, in Thailand, foreign firms' carbon emissions per unit of output are double that of domestic firms on average. So this gap is driven by certain manufacturing industry industries in the elect electricity sector, uh, where foreign multinationals are likely to operate in the most polluting segments of the value chain. In the top right panel, we see that fossil fuels also account for over 88% of greenfield FDI stocks that goes to energy generation in six ASEAN countries, as shown by the blue bars. So there is scope for increasing the contribution of FDI to green growth and decarbonization. Uh, let's look at the, the international commitments uh, from ASEAN uh, countries to green growth. I mean, they have all ratified most major multilateral environment uh, environmental agreements. As of 2017, all of them signed and ratified the Paris Agreement and submitted the nationally determined contributions, thereby committing uh, to reduce their greenhouse growth emissions. Yet only Singapore, uh, Lao PDR and Vietnam have committed to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. And five ASEAN member states have no committed, no commitment to net zero and most uh, countries require substantial international support to achieve their commitments. We also see that three countries, Brunei, Laos, PDR, and Singapore, have incorporated specific targets for emission reductions in the transport sector, uh, although this sector is responsible for a quarter of ASEAN's CO2 emissions. So setting targets for increased investments in low emission transport infrastructure could help advance ASEAN's climate targets and ambitions. So in my last slide, I would like to, to, to show the, the various forms of financial support that are provided in ASEAN for green investment, which is particularly important when you want to uh, promote sustainable investment. Um, you can see that all ASEAN member states provide investment incentives to promote green investment. They typically target green sectors, like renewables or bioplastics, as well as energy efficiency and green innovation. However, as you can also see in the table, there are five ASEAN countries which provide uh, similar incentive packages to green 
and non-green substitutes in targeted sectors. For instance, both renewable and conventional energy generation are eligible for corporate tax holidays in several countries. And the same goes for bioplastics and conventional plastics in Malaysia and Thailand. So this reduces the ultimate effectiveness of the incentive packages and efforts to promote green investment. In fact, in Thailand, we found that significantly more investment applications were received for, uh, for non biodegradable plastics than bioplastics between 2016 and 2018, as an illustration. So as a conclusion, ASEAN countries would thus benefit for, for, from classifying green and non-green activities uh, in targeted sectors using emerging taxonomies and scaling down or phasing out slowly but surely uh, investment incentives for non-green activities. So on, on this, I, I will, I will stop here. Um, thank you for uh, your attention and uh, over to you, I think, um, Ambassador. Great, thank you very much, Alex. That was a very excellent summary of the report, which is a very full report and very detailed. Uh, I now turn to the uh, first of our panelists. Today, we're honored to have Genevieve Din, the Public Policy Head of Sustainability Strategy for Asia Pacific and Japan at Amazon Web Services. In this capacity, she works with the local and international AWS leadership to closely engage key government officials and wider policy stakeholders on technology policies for sustainable innovation. She has more than a decade of experience in sustainability and worked closely with Singapore's political leadership in the ministries of foreign affairs, finance, and national develop, development to develop national policies on climate finance and carbon pricing, climate change mitigation and adaptation, and national R&D, energy innovation, tech and enterprise policies to improve Singapore's economic competitiveness in a sustainable way. Genevieve holds a BA from Duke University in the US in political science, philosophy, and economics, and an MSc in global governance and diplomacy from the University of Oxford, specializing in global financial governance. So there's no doubt that she is well qualified to address these topics. So Jenny, yeah. the screen is yours. Thank you so much, Ambassador. I think, um, Shinwei, you had some questions for us. Can you hear me? Hey, Jen. Um, we were we, we're not at Q and A yet, but um, okay. you know, if you wanted to to address, you know, which key sectors you you think uh, uh, ASEAN should prioritize. Um, with the goal of reducing FDI restrictions, that this this might be a a, a point at which uh, to to speak on it, and then we can move on back to Richard thereafter. Got it. Thank you so much for the time. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I'm so honored to be on this panel with everyone else today. Um, I think the key sectors um, of uh, that we should be prioritizing are actually the key sources of carbon in ASEAN, right? And these two sectors are power and the nature sectors. So let's start first with the energy sector, and I think specifically the renewable energy market and enabling private sector corporate investment and procurement. So OECD empirical analysis found that the choice of investment locations for investors outside of the energy sector are actually more tightly linked to broader investment climate uh, conditions in destination economies than actually the strength of national climate policies. And so enabling corporate uh, renewable energy procurement investment, I think, is key to that. Amazon ourselves are on our path to 100% being powered by renewable energy by 2025. That's five years earlier than our original commitment in 2030. And in Asia Pacific and Japan, our utility scale solar and wind project investments in Australia, China, Japan, um, Singapore, India, and Indonesia are bringing new approaches to and associated capital, green jobs, and technology across the region. However, I'd like to point out actually, and this is, um, this is also makes reference to the OECD report. Us, Asia Pacific and ASEAN markets remain the most challenging in the world for businesses seeking 100% renewable energy. And this is in part due to limited availability of renewable energy and due regulatory complexity and high costs. So we think that leveraging corporate purchasing power to advance the decarbonization of the electricity system and support new investments is especially important. Um, we work very closely with public and private sector organizations to overcome these barriers. 
Um, and these include organizations like the Clean Energy Investment Accelerator in Indonesia, the Japan Climate Leaders Partnership, and the Renewable Energy Demand Enhancement Initiative in India. So we encourage um, flexible market structures and especially the direct procurement of renewable energy um, by corp corporations uh, from suppliers. Um, and in APEC, um, we think Australia and Singapore offer really good models for this. And we have also seen significant progress in India and Japan. As of two years ago, it was not possible to make large scale PPA um, conclusions. And actually now you can. And in India today, Amazon has over 720 megawatts of renewable energy capacity, um, which we think is, is quite sizable. And where PPAs is not possible, other structures are possible. For example, in Indonesia, um, we are proud to say that we have signed a deal with the state-owned energy firm PLN to procure 210 megawatts of renewable energy um, directly from infrastructure that PLN builds themselves. Um, just a few quick words on the nature sector. We think ASEAN has so much potential when it comes to decarbonizing uh, through investment in the nature sector uh, and nature-based solutions. Natural environment degradation is the second largest source of Southeast Asia's greenhouse gas emissions, 80% of which come from Indonesia. And so it would really benefit um, and reduce um, carbon emissions if we can commit to reducing and preventing natural environment degradation. And just name some of the key challenges really quickly. Governments are struggling to reconcile economic and environmental objectives. Um, I think um, Alexandra pointed to that earlier when he talked about conflicting policies and incentives for both um, green and non-green investments, right? Um, so um, for example, Indonesia's omnibus bill in 2020 uh, weakened legal, legal protection for natural forests, um, contradicting its moratorium in 2019 for forest uh, on forest clearing for plantations. There's also very limited knowledge to develop and monitor MBS projects in ASEAN and Southeast Asia, and the absence of solutions to price nature effectively. Um, Amazon has made substantial investments in nature-based solutions. We are part of the LEAF Coalition, uh, which is an ambitious public-private um, initiative designed to protect tropical forests and uh, support sustainable development. development. And that has catalyzed over a billion dollars in funding so far. We also have a right now climate fund, a $100 million fund to protect and restore forest. And you might have heard of the recent establishment of the Blue Carbon Institute, um, right here in Singapore, and that is meant uh, to support the restoration and protection of course of blue carbon ecosystems in Southeast Asia and Japan. Uh, so we think it's really important um, that these two sectors, energy and nature-based solutions, um, are sectors that the governments should reduce barriers to entry so that we can accelerate decarbonization. Thanks. Hmm. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Genevieve. That was a very good uh, uh, exposition on the importance of nature-based solutions uh, to sustainable sustainability products uh, problems, and also very good examples of some of the things that uh, your company is doing in this uh, in this area. I think the uh, the thing that you mentioned on PPAs and direct purchase agreements is very important. I know we're we're working on that in several countries around the ASEAN region, and I hope that people will be able to adapt to those uh, uh, those new types of, of uh, policies very soon. Um, let me now uh, let me now turn to the next uh, the next panelists. And uh, before I do that, I just want to make sure that uh, the audience realizes that you may pose questions at any time by typing your questions using the chat function or raise your hand and we'll call you during the question and answer period. Our next panelist is Richard Lomas and we're honored to have Richard who joined uh, City in 2018 as Senior Vice President for Government Affairs in the Asia Pacific region, initially in Hong Kong and now based right here in Singapore. Richard focuses on regional public policy issues such as data, the digital economy, trade and ESG finance. He has more than 15 years government affairs experience and joined City from American Express in London, where he was part of a team leading the company's EMEA government affairs strategy. He worked per previously for the UK private industry, uh, private equity industry, and for a Westminster public affairs consultancy, and as a researcher to the UK economic secretary to the treasury. Richard has a BSc from the London School of Economics and an MBA from Imperial College Business School. Richard, the screen is yours. 
Thanks very much, um, Ambassador, and thank you um, as well to the organisers for the, for the invitation today. Um, I wanted to start actually by saying um, for a bit of context that we're about a third of the way now through the critical decade of the 2020s in which globally we need to be reducing emissions by at least 40% um, in order to meet net zero targets by the middle of the century. Um, but of course, that's not really what's happening because emissions continue to rise. Um, and beyond that, the financing that we need to get there is, is not coming forward. Um, and so I wanted to focus my remarks um, in that context. Um, City, together with lots of other financial institutions, has set um, targets in order to meet net zero for its own operations as well as for, as well as for its loan book. That second piece is obviously much more difficult if you think about the clients that we work with um, in the real economy and the difficulties that they are going to have to get to net zero. And that's why we see the role of financial institutions very much as one of stewarding um, uh, firms in the real economy to get to net zero and to work on their own uh, transition plans to get there over the next couple of decades. Um, and, and I think as well, this report from the OECD is really timely in that respect and has a really useful lens to shine on this problem uh, and to sort of remind us that there's a lot more that we need to be doing to get to where we need to go. The big, the big picture numbers sometimes in this, um, in this space are pretty frightening. Um, more than $9 trillion per year is going to be needed to get to, to net zero by 2050. Globally, we're probably about two thirds of the way there at the moment, um, about a 30 plus percent gap if you look across the world but in Asia and in ASEAN in particular, we need to be doing a lot more. And some data that we have suggests that we need at least a quadrupling of, um, of funding in this space to be on course to meet, um, to meet our objectives, to be in line with the Paris Agreement by the middle of the century. Um, so that's kind of the big, sort of big picture context I wanted to mention. Um, I think from an FDI perspective, I just want to also pay tribute to the work the OECD has been doing for a number of years on regulatory restrictiveness. Uh, and in detailing what more member states need to be doing themselves to attract additional capital inflows. I think that work has been extremely useful. Um, and I think starting to address this from a sustainable investment standpoint is, is obviously extremely useful as well. Um, I would highlight the role of investment um, promotion agencies in particular, which Alex touched on earlier on as being one key conduit to thinking about um, what else can be done to attract additional sustainable FDI. Um, I thought your data point on the percentage of ASEAN member states that are already looking at this and using low, low carbon indicators as compared with the OECD as a whole is actually really interesting. But as you said, they kind of need to follow through on that um, and be doing more to make sure that happens in practice is, is obviously critical. Um, from the perspective of, of, of city um, and low carbon FDI, in particular, I wanted to focus on a couple of quick points. One is around um, diversification of supply chains in particular. Um, you know, we all know on this call that um, the pandemic, as well as other factors like geopolitical tensions have offered um, significant opportunities for supply chain diversification for, for ASEAN. Um, and we think that those uh, opportunities will continue to be realized over the coming years. But there's a lot more that we, we think can be done to look at uh, sustainable supply chains in particular and the role that financing can play um, to, to, uh, to, to try to bring that about. So in particular, sustainable supply chain finance can, uh, can have buyers in the supply chain acting as an anchor for incentivizing their suppliers to improve their own carbon footprints. And we think if you, if you think about that from an FDI perspective and the capital flows involved, then there's a lot more that can be done there to, to bring about additional sustainable low carbon FDI um, throughout the supply chain. Um, there are specific examples I could talk about, about kind of pricing discounts in this, in this respect to incentivize firms to do exactly that. But that's the kind of practical thing I think that could really help when we're talking about what else could be done to, um, to improve the situation here. And then the other thing I would mention is that there's a lot of interesting work being done by, um, by groups like the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development um, to help firms themselves to build internal green management systems 
so that when they're thinking about the way, where they need to be going as a business, um, sustainable, low carbon FDI is, is absolutely what they're shooting for themselves. So I think we need to be um, looking at this problem from both from both aspects, if you like, from the top down and from, from the bottom up. Um, there's a couple of other things I would just quickly mention and just sort of conscious of not speaking for too long, but I think the incentives packages that Alex mentioned um, on the policy side from the ASEAN member states is obviously key as well. Um, there's a lot more I think that we could talk about here around some of the mechanisms that ASEAN member states themselves are looking at to create structures which will incentivize private capital to flow on, um, uh, on the low carbon side. So it, in particular around energy transition, and I can speak more about that if it's useful. Uh, and then the final thing I would mention is that, you know, on the policy framework side, for a long time, the sector now has been talking about the need to enable um, financial firms to identify what is and what is not a sustainable asset, and therefore to, to make decisions on how to invest in it. And so both uh, locally, regionally, and, and indeed globally, there's a lot of work going on around taxonomy and disclosure regimes, and those are kind of fundamental, critical pieces of uh, building blocks for, for broader green, green markets, we believe. Um, and then, you know, uh, final point I'd make is that in addition to the disclosures that we think firms should be making today in terms of where they are in respect to their own carbon footprints, there is more that we think could be done around where they're heading. So this is, this is often referred to as transition planning. So having something in the public domain that says not just what does a firm's carbon footprint look like now, but how is it planning to get to achieve net zero by 2050? And there's a lot of work going on within the central banking system, actually, and from a supervisory perspective in terms of how that um, whole debate could be shaped and what, what role financial institutions themselves could play to incentivize and encourage that work to happen in a way that gives us all more clarity on, um, on where these firms are heading, number one, and then number two, that will underpin and reinforce opportunities around um, additional sustainable FDI coming into the region. So I think I'd leave it there with some, some opening comments, but um, happy to pick up on any of that or answer any, any questions as we go. Thank you, Richard. That was, that was an excellent, those are some excellent insights. Um, it's particularly striking, I think, when when you when you set the context of what's happening about the forty percent this uh, reduction that's needed to reach net zero by by the middle of the century, and you know it's taking place against a backdrop of it, right emissions rising, and the financing that's not coming forward. You know, at the, at the Heinrich Foundation, we um, we deal we focus very much on trade policy, so we know what exactly what you're talking about when you're talking about. The sea change, the sea changes that are happening in supply chain diversification, that you know, driven by geopolitics and the pandemic. We, we think that you know the, the convergence to carbon pricing that you sort of alluded to, that's that's key as well. Um, but you know, I mean, uh, it it it's a it's a good response to to Alex's paper, which the upshot of which really is that removing restrictions to FDI is is. It's, it's not a panacea, but really it's just it's the thinking um, in terms of a framework that actually already exists in terms of the uh, SDGs, in terms of the OECD FDI index uh, that's perhaps more important. And over in ASEAN, uh, people have been removing restrictions, people have been moving towards sustainability, but it's been very patchy. And as Alex's report points out, and as Catherine sort of alluded to earlier, uh, greenfield investment in particular has been in decline. Uh, some countries, some economies have been benefiting more than others, Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore in particular, more than half of the FDI gains have been going to Singapore in the last 10 years. I mean, these are just some of the nuggets that came out of Alex's uh, report. Um, I, I, I thought that we, you know, we, we could take a step back at this point and, and think about, uh, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd like to hear Ambassador Michalik, your, your, your takeaways when you went through the, the, the report and you deal with uh, US firms that are operating in ASEAN a lot. Um, what are your thoughts on, you know, when, when, you, when you read Alex's report and what are your key takeaways for what you would tell the companies that you work with? Well, you know, the, the report had an awful lot of good, uh, good information in it. And I think that actually Richard kind of touched on some of the points. 
uh, in particular, the role of investment promotion, promotion agencies. Right. Uh, these have been quite useful uh, around the uh, around the region, and I think are leading the way uh, in trying to promote uh, reform in the uh, investment space. Uh, but I think that uh, one of the things that that we really need to do uh, is, and again, this was mentioned in the report, is that there's not a very tight or a very close. Uh, relationship between the sustainability part of productivity, the sustainability part of, of worker uh, improvements, and of incoming uh, foreign investment. And I think that somehow, given, again, the backdrop that Richard uh, mentioned of uh, $9 trillion being needed in order to reach the, uh, the minimum uh, Paris goals, yeah. that this is something that, that we probably need to focus on a little bit more intensely uh, the closer the closer we get to 2050 and the closer we get to uh, many of these uh, issues. And one thing which keeps coming to my mind, uh, which was mentioned in the report and has been mentioned by Richard, is mentioned by uh, many of our companies, is the need for standardization and harmonization of uh, investment uh, regulations and of uh, investment taxonomies and just definitions so we know what we're talking about when we try to measure the effectiveness of investment and how it uh, helps or hinders uh, sustainability going forward. Uh, I know that the uh, uh, ASEAN has been working on very hard on it, uh, investment taxonomy, um, and they're now on the the second version of it, I believe. But uh, they have asked the U.S. ASEAN Business Council to take a look at their their taxonomy and try and give them some uh, some uh, advice or some uh, reflection on how various companies are are looking at these types of taxonomies because. If we're not speaking the same language, then you are indeed going to find that investors are not going to be willing <clears throat> to step yeah. forward because you know, they're not going to know, okay, whose definition of a return are we using here and uh, how is that going to affect my own uh, investment in uh, something that is sustainable? So I think yeah. standardization, clarity, uh, say it in simple language that SMEs can understand, and some of the uh, older economists like myself, who is a former physicist, <laughs> can understand as well. Yeah. Uh, so uh, those things and cut the red tape. Uh, I spent. I was just coming back from uh, uh, an engagement in the Philippines and had a great conversation with the Anti-Red Tape Association, which is a wonderful organization. Yeah. And we ought to definitely prioritize the establishment of that in every ASEAN country and every, heck, in every country around the globe, because that's what it's going to take to make things clear and to help us to illuminate the, the path going forward. Yeah. No, that's, that, that's, that's really fascinating. And, and conversely, um, you know, I, I saw an interesting statistic in, in Alex's report that for every 10% increase uh, that an economy makes in the OECD FDI index amounts to about a 2% in, uh, increase, right, Alex, in the inward FDI. So, so that's the kind of like the, the, the converse of, of what you're talking about. But the taxonomy point is, 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 is equally key and equally interesting. And, you know, in taxonomy, you, you, you could be talking about a whole range of different things. I mean, in, in trade, for example, it, it's uh, you know relates to coding, um, and how you label goods for one thing. And it might be a good time to 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 ask uh, you know the the only ones here in the in the corporate sector. I mean, in uh, in the corporate world, I guess Jen and Richard about um, what what kind of hurdles and and one one thing that sort of I'm curious about is data collection um, and Jen perhaps you could speak to that um, you're on mute Jen oh thanks very much yeah thanks for that question we think getting data 
um, period is what is most challenging um, in sustainable investment. Okay, so getting data itself to begin with is a huge challenge. And we think that's where technology can come in. Um, we can reshape the, um, the data or ESG data challenge into what we call a technology or innovation challenge, right? And when we reframe it that way, um, we can actually use technology as a way to overcome this challenge. So I would encourage regulators to look at supporting and incentivizing enablers or accelerators uh, for decarbonizing, um, such as supporting cloud frameworks. Um, and I think um, at one point the IEA was saying that one of the most transformative roles that cloud can play is to accelerate the sustainability innovation process itself, right? So cloud-enabled technologies such as AI, ML, IoT, and edge computing will be critical to accelerating systemic sustainability transformations. Um, and this includes um, providing uh, access to open source data um, on ESG and climate modeling. Uh, it can provide um, uh, data um, that will help with the verification and the monitoring and the reporting of sustainability metrics um, or sustainability claims that companies have made. Right? So for example, you could get a drone um, to, drones to fly over um, areas that are meant to be uh, reforested. Um, and then you can use AI to verify that the forests or the patches of the forest are being reforested. So gathering data from um, the, the points um, of, of, of development, uh, the developing uh, developers and the projects themselves actually, and then using technology to sort, integrate, analyze the data. Um, we think that cloud plays a critical role um, in this. And if governments can help support the um, backbone infrastructure as um, referred to sometimes, um, cloud can actually be an enabler and accelerator of decarbonization and overcoming the data challenge. Yeah, I think data is absolutely a critical piece of this whole um, this whole debate, and there's several different levels to this that I, I've mentioned. One is just the the macroeconomic question of what even are the relevant um, related data that we need from a climate perspective to understand the risks that we face, um, whether that's from a you know physical uh, risk, transition risk. You know, central bankers themselves, I think, are asking this question at the moment: is where what do we need? What are the right frameworks to understand the risks themselves? But then that conversation is going on at a sort of a high level. Um, and that I think relates to, to climate scenarios around stress testing and what, what individual companies, economies are being asked to do around different um, sets of, of outcomes here. Um, there's another piece which we touched on earlier around allowing investors to make decisions based on the right kinds of data. And that I think very much speaks to the taxonomy and disclosure and transition planning points that I was, I was referencing earlier on. Um, and I think the critical point there is you, you'll hear from lots of companies and lots of financial institutions is that consistency and comparability is really the key here because you can have a very um, cogent set of um, requirements for a given economy, but if they don't relate to what's happening in other economies, both regionally and globally, then it's very difficult for um, investors in particular to make you know, informed decisions about um, what is genuinely sustainable or what's on the path to becoming sustainable and how do I, um, how do I build this into my decision-making about where to deploy capital. So that's the second point I'd make. The third point I think is around data in respect of supply chains in particular. So we, we talk a lot about this um, at a kind of at an industry level, and there's a lot of discussion from a public policy um, standpoint. But I think the reality is that we're really missing a lot of the information, particularly lower down the supply chain, to give us a clear view on what particularly what the emissions are for a given company's overall supply chain. And you know, I've heard lots of companies try to talk around this and say that they have a great line of sight on on what the emissions are throughout the supply chain. I think I think a lot of the time that's not not always the case. Uh, and the reality is that um, we need to do a lot more to evidence this data and to provide much more transparency um, for firms at you know, the larger end of the supply chain, but also for, for policymakers as well. Um, and you know, I'd cite Singapore's Project Greenprint as, as one you know, example of trying to, trying to advance that debate, developing things like ESG registries uh, and using other aspects of technology to try and bring this together um, and have you know a, a baseline set of information that we can use to help answer some of these big questions because without without data as a kind of fundamental building block 
to know what the challenges are that we're facing, it's very difficult to, to measure and, and to take action, of course. So they're, they're, the, they're the three areas that I would I'd mention. You know, I'd like to jump in and ask a question, though, because if we do need that kind of data, we do need uh, to have the, that sort of clarity. What's going on now with so many countries putting so many restrictions on cross-border data flows? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, um, it's a great point and not always one that's drawn together or joined together, I think, from, from a policymaker's perspective, which is um, to think about some of these issues from a climate and a sustainability standpoint. Often data, I think, is looked at as a bit of a silo um, and, and not in, in this broader context. And so I think, you know, the more that we can do as firms and as organizations that are on this call to explain that the effective and secure uh, cross-border transfer of data um, around the region and, and, and frankly around the world is useful, um, not only for, um, you know, in my sector, region, um, uh, uh, advantages such as screening for fraud and anti-money laundering, to give one example, which we talk about a lot, but also um, to to enable this um, this climate debate to be properly had and to be properly understood, I think is is advantageous for all of us, frankly. Yeah, I would like to second what um, Richard said. I will fully support the free flow of cross-border data. And we think it's so critical to digital economy and digital innovation, including sustainability innovation, right? And if you prevent um, the transfer of data from one country to another, you're actually impeding the pace of innovation, um, as well as the pace of innovation in sustainability itself. Um, data localization requirements that limit services available um, or the data subjects um, also increase the costs for companies and increase barriers to entry. Um, and that is as not healthy for, for innovation. I'd um, like to point out as well that we are very supportive of initiatives, for example, green economy agreements that are starting bilaterally uh, in Singapore with other countries, but we hope will extend eventually to the whole of ASEAN. Um, and this can be paired and be very complementary to um, digital economy agreements. A big part of digital economy agreements and green economy agreements, we think, um, can be in ensuring um, the free flow of cross-border data um, as a key enabler um, to accelerating innovation in the space. I, I, I just throw this out there, um, and it's not it's not really on a script, but um, um, you know when you think of all the multilateral uh, frameworks that are occurring in the region and that are evolving, I mean, are they actually helping? Are they addressing these issues that you're talking about? And I, I'm I'm thinking IPEF in particular, but also APEC, CPTPP. You know, we see all these, as you say, Jen, all these bilateral relationships trying to get at the problem, but we don't really see a multilateral um, leadership on this issue. Um, do you, what do you guys think? Is, uh, is there enough that's being done to address this? I mean, for, from my perspective, um, we can't have too much of this. I think it's better to address in as many ways as possible. Um, for the financial sector in particular, this is often seen as a bit of a hard problem from a policymaker's standpoint. Um, financial information is often an area that regulators think about wanting to keep on shore. Um, and so in seeking to overcome that challenge, I don't think there's one, you know, there's not a panacea to it. There's not one set of, um, or even one solution that we would point to as if this will solve our challenge. We need to be addressing this as, in as many ways as we can, whether that's through digital economy agreements, through uh, IPEF, whether it's multilaterally, bilaterally, plurilaterally, whatever it is. Um, you know, mechanisms like APEX CBPR, we think are very helpful. They don't really work for banks and financial institutions like ours. Um, we think there's some potential to have a conversation about reforming that scheme. Um, over time, but you know, at the same time, we we very much support the intent and and the you know the spirit of that of that mechanism. Um, one global uh, sort of idea mechanism I would refer to is the work that the Japan has been doing for a number of years now around the concept of data free flow of trust, um, and that um, is a concept that hasn't had a lot of kind of information behind it for for a couple of years now, but as part of its G seven presidency this year, Japan is seeking to make some significant progress on what that kind of initiative might look like, which would seek to address this from, from more of a global standpoint. 
Uh, and we've been very, you know, very encouraging of that work and also keen to make sure that the financial sector is part of the discussion as well. So my, my, my it's a long answer to what could be a shorter response, which is essentially that we just need to be doing as much of this as possible to be overcoming these challenges. Yeah. Um, well, I think that, that, like to just chip in here a bit, and that is that uh, you're right. And I think that the, the, the point is that there are a lot of multilateral and plurilateral discussions going on. The OECD has got, I don't know how many different uh, works, work streams going on, on in terms of, of looking at what, does, what do digital agreements look like. The uh, ASEAN has got the, the DIFA, uh, which is getting, getting uh, going into high speed and which is also reaching out to uh, partners and others outside of uh, ASEAN to again, to comment and to try to, to uh, help to make that as, as comprehensive a, a set of a, a framework as, as we can. Uh, IPEF itself uh, is trying to look at many of these principles and again, to put together communities of people who are trying to think along the same lines and trying to have some kind of a standardized framework that we can all uh, get on board with and and use as a as a community, but I think a lot more work needs to be done on cross cross organization discussions right. so that we can try to begin at least to look at at what a uh, 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 what what a harmonized or what a a standardized or at least some kind of uh, you know, the, I think in TPP, we used to call it regulatory coherence. Well, in, in this, that's what we need here as well, is, is sort of uh, digital economic uh, framework agreement coherence. Uh, DEFA coherence is the new, the new buzzword, I guess. Right. Jen, did you have, have any thoughts? You, you, you look like you were going to say something earlier. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, I think each of these uh, multilateral, plurilateral agreements understand the importance of both digital trade and digitalization, as well as sustainability. So you will see among all of these plurilateral, multilateral agreements, um, main pillars, which will include both digitalization as well as sustainability. And I think that needs to be built on. Um, of course, you know, countries like Singapore take um, the approach of first engaging like-minded countries that are able to meet high standards and then expandi expanding that membership um, subsequently, right? And I, I think they're taking the same approach to green economy agreements. And um, they that might be the most effective way to get something off the ground instead of having uh, to agree, for instance, um, for all ASEAN member states um, to land on a single agreement um, at, at, the, at the start. I think a piecemeal um, approach, if um, effective, is, is, is also one way of accelerating um, change. Right. But um, sort of goes back to that frightening statistic that Richard was highlighting earlier about the need in ASEAN to quadruple the level of funding um, that's needed in this space to um, to to make the targets that that have been set. Um, Ambassador, what do you think? Uh, we, we should we uh, press on or? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think we've got. Uh... We got a pretty good discussion going here today. Yeah. Where there, there seems to be—is that a question in there? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, here we go. The nine trillion dollars needed to meet Paris goal. This requires this is probably reforestation. A it's a question from Richard, I think. Um, and the question is: Yeah, where do you see the money coming from? Absolutely, a question for Richard. <laughs> uh, Richard, can can you read it, or shall I read it for you? So I, I think the question is about where's the money coming from, yeah. um, and and then the second question about SMEs, from what I could get, get gather right. from the from the chat. So I tr try to I try to address both. Um, Yes, absolutely. That where's the money coming from? This is a question that we um, are and a conversation that we're having regularly with um, with policymakers and with other financial institutions. Uh, I alluded in my comments to additional mechanisms that governments can be thinking about to bring private money to the table. Um, it's sometimes referred to as blended finance, concessional capital, whatever kind of technical term you want to use. But the principle here is 
how do you use public money? Um, uh, that can be from governments or from <coughs> development finance institutions or from philanthropy or wherever to um, to incentivize private capital to come in on a project that they otherwise would not do so and not be able to do so because of the, um, the rate of return involved. And if you think about the ultimate investors in, in lots of these um, projects, it's, it's often, you know, pensioners and pension funds who are uh, the ultimate sources of the capital. And the managers of that money have a fiduciary responsibility to produce a certain return on behalf of those um, on behalf of those you know pensioners, for example. And so, some of the projects that we're talking about here would only produce very low rates of return, perhaps in the you know the low single digits. And that's not therefore something that these um, funds can invest in while still meeting the, the fiduciary responsibility that they have. And so. What we need to do here is create mechanisms which, if you like, kind of inflates the return on the private side by using public capital um, to do that. And there are lots of kind of interesting, quite sophisticated financial structures, which I won't try to talk about um, on this call. But um, the, the principle is, is exactly that, to, to create a way in which those funds can come in and have their return meet what needs to be done in order to um, provide the, the return that their own um, fund holders themselves are looking for um, and to do that in a way that uses public money effectively. Now, these are conversations that have been happening for some time, but um, I think they've been accelerated by two specific developments. One is uh, a just energy transition partnership for Indonesia and one is a just energy transition partnership for Vietnam, both of which were um, launched at the end of last year. Um, City and, and other financial institutions are part of the private sector working group, which is um, which is involved in these these detailed discussions to try to come up with the the, the right sort of structures. Um, you know, it's going to need a lot for this to to happen in practice and to to operationalize um, not just the public money side of it, but also making sure that there are reforms to domestic uh, energy sectors, for example, to to just in, even to allow the private money to flow in the first place. Um, and so, you know, that is a very key aspect, I think, of, uh, in terms of how we do this and how we actually bring more money to the table. That I think, I think um, blended finance concessional capital is really a key part of the equation that we, we need to solve. Um, actually, maybe I'll pause there and see if others have anything to add on that point before trying to address the other question. I just really agree with the idea of trying to use public money to, to de-risk uh, some of the uh, incentive uh, structures that others are talking about. So, yeah. But okay. again, I, mm. tough. Sorry, I just, I agree with that. And I think a key part on raising finance is actually to raise um, the carbon price. Um, I think carbon prices need to rise to at least 10 to $15 per ton of CO2 in order to compete with, um, or to be competitive with palm oil and rubber, right? And these are the types of uh, prices we'll need to incentivize the shift or the pivoting of investments in current brown power and typical traditional sectors uh, and industries into the green um, green sectors. And I think it's super important as well to accelerate the development of market-based solutions, including access to international voluntary uh, carbon markets, um, to use carbon prices as a means to value and protect nature. Um, I think there's so much opportunity. Uh, I think there's a $29 billion um, annual investable opportunity in ASEAN uh, when it comes to nature-based solutions. And I think carbon price is key to that. Yeah, just if I could come in on the carbon pricing point, absolutely is a critical critical part of the whole um, the whole debate here. Um, you know, I think for some time there's been a, an acceptance of the fact that we need carbon pricing in order to scale up the funding that is required to get to net zero. I think the questions have been around how do you do that and what are the relative roles for so-called compliance carbon markets, so the sort of regulated side of carbon markets, carbon prices, carbon taxes, and um, as, as compared to voluntary carbon markets and, and the role for uh, those sorts of carbon credits and how that framework is set. I think as this debate moves on, there's a recognition that we need both and it's not, it's not an either or, it's a complementary piece. Um, you know, I think clearly on the, on the compliance side, setting a carbon price that is, you know, even re regional, let alone global, is an extremely difficult thing to do. Uh, and that's why organizations like um, the IFC and IMF and others have talked about the principle of an international carbon pricing floor, which would recognize distinctions in 
uh, GDP composition um, in order to to say that it might not be uniform across the globe, but might might be set into different different categories or different buckets, which might help us get to towards something that's a bit more consistent. Um, and then on the voluntary side, I think the really critical piece is around um, the credibility of the credit itself, the underlying uh, credit. And there's been a lot of work that's been done by organisations like the um, uh, the Voluntary Carbon Markets Institute to try to come up with a set of core carbon principles, which would um, which would try to address that particular problem. I think it's you know I think there's a way to go, but I think um, you know the, the the sort of short response is we need to be doing much more on both sides, both the compliance and the voluntary side of carbon markets to make carbon pricing itself a, a big a bigger part of the solution to the financing debate. Mm -hmm. Right. We've we've been given the 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 cue that uh, it, it we're sort of bumping up against time, but but I I I want to just uh, slip in a, a very last one for for Richard. When you say a way to go, you know, obviously, uh, the convergence in carbon pricing around the world right now uh, is something that ideally should be happening. I mean, there's there's still a very wide disparity of prices. Mm -hmm. Um, probably because of the different me mechanisms, the different levels of de development, all, all that is understandable. But the disparities are, in, in a way, impeding uh, a sense of order in this market. I mean, would you do? Do, do you think that's, uh, you know, when you say a way to go? I mean, um, how long do you think it'll take, and is it soon enough? Mm. <laughs> Well, I think the reality is that there's there's a lot of urgency in this in this uh, in this space, and, and we almost can't act too quickly. I think difficult to assess how how long it will take to get to, to the right sort of place on um, on carbon markets and carbon pricing. The thing I'd focus on is the level of activity that we have seen and the recognition from policymakers of what needs to happen. So, you know, I take your point on disparity, and and you know, the World Bank has a very useful carbon pricing dashboard that sets this out in one place and shows what activity is happening and, and, and the different levels at which um, uh, the prices are set at the moment. But if you take a jurisdiction like Singapore, for example, which introduced a carbon price um, relatively recently at a fairly low level, that was done with the kind of express intent of raising that number over time, but, but mm. of doing it in a way that wasn't going to spook the market, so to speak. So yeah. I, think, I think where I would focus is on um, the fact that the policymakers themselves understand the objective and where they need to go, but that that may take different forms and and be done in different <coughs> along different timelines, um, and that as I say, it needs to be needs to be done both from a regulatory compliance standpoint, but also from the perspective of industry as well, because the voluntary carbon space has there's huge potential, particularly in, in as I cited to Genevieve's earlier point. I mean, the level of um, uh, sort of the provision of the credits themselves and, and ASEAN's role in that, I think, uh, could be you know could be huge going forward. But setting the right framework and, and making sure that we have the right sort of guardrails around the credits and enabling them to be traded across borders is really where it's going to be at over the next kind of um, few years. I would, I would say. Totally agree. We're back to definitions and back to standardization again. And the more that we can do, yeah, right. we're gonna have, but it, it, the urgency is such that we gotta work with what we got and we gotta work a little bit faster than where we are at this point. Right. So what do you think, Chun Wei? I think it's been a heck of a day. Yeah, um, we, I think we're bumping up against the, uh, uh, the, the limits set by our, our custodians, our stewards. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, we'd like to, you know, thank you to everyone. I mean, th thank you, Ambassador. Um, thank mm. you, Catherine, Alex, for hanging by all this time. Um, Jen and Richard, I mean, you guys have been fantastic. Um, and to all the participants out there, uh, that's the uh, screen, that's the QR code for our weekly newsletter. If you wanted to uh, subscribe, I highly recommend it. Thank yep. you. And I'd also, I'd also like to thank all of our guests for uh, attending this event, especially our speakers and the panelists. And if there are still any questions out there, because we didn't get to the one on SMEs, and I think that's a really important one, yeah. uh, but continue to reach out to the Heinrich Foundation and to the USABC team, and we'll try to 
make sure that we get you some response to the questions that you have. And I understand that we'll be providing copies of the presentation within the week. And uh, from, uh, from my point of view, I would like to say that uh, this has been very, very enjoyable. I hope that you all, uh, well, from beautiful downtown Tanjong Pagar here in the heart of Singapore. Thank you for a wonderful presentation, a wonderful discussion, and I wish you all a great rest of the week and stay safe and stay happy. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.